and also a big congratulations to Dr. Mohammed on his retirement. I wish him the very best for all things to come. So as previously mentioned, um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Manchester uh, within the Department of Chemistry. Um, and a lot of my work focuses on uh, the photochemistry and photophysics of organic and inorganic materials. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about the uh, phenomenon of two photon absorption. So I'm going to start at the basic level. There are 134 participants in the conference. Apologies if Apologies. Uh, this, is, this is too simplistic for some of you who are unaware of uh, everyone's background. So with, in the case of one, th one photon absorption, uh, you get excitation from S0 to S1 in the region of 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, from this higher vibrational level of the first electronic excited state, you can get uh, vibrational relaxation and then either fluorescence or internal conversion where the molecule returns to the ground state with, uh, without the release of a photon. It's also possible to undergo inter-system crossing uh, where the molecule will transition from a singlet state over to a triplet and then from the lowest vibrational level of this triplet state you can also see relaxation to the ground state through the emission of a now longer wavelength photon. And the efficiency of these, each of these uh, processes can vary from molecule to molecule and even across solvent to solvent. Uh, here we have an example of an organic dye um, in hexane on the left, toluene in the center, and dichloromethane on the right. And you can see a, a bright yellow luminescence under a UV lamp in the hexane, a slightly less intense red in the uh, toluene, and then no luminescence at all in the dichloromethane. Now, if we extend out past the range of one photon absorption, we can achieve two photon absorption uh, by, depending on the, the molecule in question, uh, exciting with a very uh, tight packet of photons, usually using a femtosecond pulse laser. And instead of going from S0 to S1, we go from S0 to a virtual state to a higher excitation, excited, electronic excited state. So in the case of uh, this fluorescein sample in the middle, uh, the lower beam is 380 nanometers and when focused to the center of the cuvette, you can see the beam coming in, it narrows to the focal point and then expands as it comes out the other side. If we double this and go to 760 nanometers, again focused to the center of the cuvette, all we see is this pinpoint of fluorescence. So this is a very localized point of excitation. Anything outside of this region does not receive uh, the second photon within a short enough time period to achieve this electronic excitation, uh, end up in this electronic excited state. So 
So there are a couple of ways of uh, quantifying this two-photon absorption, and one of them is uh, using a Z-scan method. So for this, you would use a femtosecond pulse beam, uh, split the beam to a, have a reference detector, and then focus the beam to a point, and then out again to a second detector, and then pass your sample through this focal point of the beam. And this will result in data that looks like this. So as you come into the focal point, you see a drop in signal. And then as you leave the focal point, you return back to essentially this uh, baseline of one. You can then fit this data using this equation, which would be rearranged to get the sigma two value, which is the two photon absorption cross section. An alternative, slightly simpler method is uh, the relative method. And this is where you use upconverted fluorescence of your sample and a reference to determine the cross-section. So here is a, it's actually the setup I use in Manchester. Um, the light is coming in here to the sample and then the luminescence comes back through and is reflected on this dichroic mirror across to a detector. And this allows me to integrate the entire fluorescent spectrum for both the sample and the reference. And then I compare this against the uh, power or the intense, uh, the power of the uh, excitation beam, the relative quantum yields and concentrations, and then again solve for uh, the two photon absorption cross section. So what is the advantage of going through all this hassle uh, in some cases to get a two photon absorption uh, spectrum? So as you can see, the B, uh, the excitation results in a, a localized volume of luminescence or excitation. And this can be incredibly useful for bioimaging applications uh, allowing you to get uh, crystal clear images without any out of plane excitation or out of plane uh, bleaching of materials. If you're working on a fabrication uh, application, then you're going to get a very small point of excitation, so you can finally con you get fine control of uh, whatever you're trying to construct, allowing much tighter, smaller structures. Another advantage uh, on the bioimaging side is that for two photon excitation, you're typically looking at this region between 700 to 900 nanometers. And in this region, there's a, a distinct dip in the absorption of uh, biological tissue and water. So this is hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. Um, so this means you're able to get much better penetration through biological tissue than you would otherwise. And this is exemplified uh, with this reconstructed 3D image on the right. This is from a wound healing model, and the level of detail in the vasculature would be lost through normal, normal histological methods where you're slicing through the sample. You would basically crush all of this fine structure. But with luminescence, you can see all of the newly formed blood vessels coming up to the scab on the tissue surface.
This is from top to bottom, left to right, uh, 1.6 millimeters. So 1600 micrometers of uh, image tissue. Give me a second. So what contributes to a, a good two photon absorbing dye? Um, one of the projects I was involved with during my PhD uh, looked at this specifically. So we have this uh, diphenyl amino uh, fluorine ligand, uh, diphenyl amino fluorine dye. There are no metals involved, so it's just a dye. Um, and varied the acceptor uh, through these moieties. And starting with the this chalcone thiophene derivative, uh, we see a two photon absorption cross section of about 70 off Myers. So if you remember from the uh, earlier slide, this is. 10 to the minus 50 photons, uh, centimeters to the minus four per second. If we follow this round to this cyanovinyl moiety, uh, the two photon absorption has now increased to over 600 Goffmeyers. And we can see a further increase going to the uh, pyran uh, cyanovinyl, which is now nearly 1600 nanometers, uh, 1600 gothamires. So going from this chalcone to this uh, pyran derivative, got a 20 fold increase in the two photon absorption cross section. Further work I was involved with uh, sought to investigate further the structure property relationship, uh, specifically in this case of um, a squarine dye on the left and an extended squarine and fluorine squarine dye. And one of the goals here was to have an extended region of higher two photon absorption cross section. Um, so for the, the squarine dye, we're now seeing an absorption maximum of around 10,000 Goffmeyers. Not uncommon for uh, squarine dyes due to their tight uh, and well overlapped uh, HOMO and LUMO. But the two photon absorption cross section drops off quite quickly. It does pick up again, but it's still only, I use the term loosely, um, around 100. So in the case of this extended dye, again, it peaks at not quite a thousand, uh, about two, three thousand. Myers, but the decay is much shallower than the uh, lone squaring dye. But by 600 nanometers, we're still looking at a cross section of around 100 Myers. But this taught us some valuable things, uh, which we went on to use in the development of uh, these two pyrene derivative, derivatized squaring dyes. Uh, one with a vinyl group, one with an alkyne. Again, with the same idea of uh, having an extended region of high two photon absorption cross section. And we see that the vinyl derivative achieves this. There's 
approximately 200 nanometer range where the cross section is holding steady at around 2000 Gotham Myers. And even past 600, we're looking at seven, eight, maybe even 900 Gotham Myers. The alkyne has a, a shorter region of uh, plateau at around 2000 Gotham Myers and shows a similar trend uh, going down to uh, three, 400 Gotham Myers at 600 nanometers. Something to be considered with two photon absorption cross sections is that uh, they are determined or di they are influenced by symmetry rules similarly to one photon absorption. However, the the exact rules are slightly different due to the nature of the transition. So in a one photon process for a symmetrical molecule, um, you go from a Gerada or symmetric ground state to a Ungerada or unsymmetrical excited state. And that's the only type of transition that's allowed. Sym symmetrical to unsymmetrical or unsymmetrical to symmetrical. In a uh, in an asymmetrical molecule, you get a slight shifting or the two photon absorption cross sections are peaked at the point where uh, roughly where the one photon absorption cross section is as there's not really a distinct line of symmetry so you can go from this slightly symmetrical, slightly unsymmetrical ground state to a slightly unsymmetrical, slightly symmetrical uh, excited state. However, for a symmetrical molecule where S1 is symmetrical and S, sorry, S0 is symmetrical, S1 is unsymmetrical, you have to go to a higher excited state that is then symmetrical as you're going through this uh, virtual state, which has to have inverse symmetry to the initial state. So in these cases, you see two photon absorption maxima outside of the linear absorption band. Now that's a lot of talking and not a lot of examples. So here are a couple of stereotypical examples. So we have this uh, guaisling derivatized uh, dye. And actually it's the, the protonated form of this dye. And this is obviously unsymmetrical in near enough every way that you would slice it. So the two photon absorption maximum occurs in exactly the same region, albeit the wavelength doubled, uh, as the single photon absorption. Now, in the case of this squarene dye, which has a point of inversion uh, within the squarene core, you see that there is no two photon absorption maximum within the uh, absorption spectrum, it's this black line in this case. Um, instead, it occurs at a shorter wavelength than expected, but it's still beyond uh, the single photon absorption. So we're looking at uh, about 750 nanometers here. So we've 
lost all of the one photon absorption and now into the region of two photon excitation. So that's the, uh, the theory. But theory isn't always obvious in some cases. So I did some work on this uh, Yanis Dion derivative, which examining the structure looks symmetrical. You have a point of inversion uh, within this, the Yanis Dion. This side of the molecule is identical to this. But the two photon absorption cross sections peaked just beyond, just short of the twice the one photon absorption spectrum. Now this was counterintuitive based on everything I've just said. This is a near symmetrical molecule. This should be uh, peaking around 800 nanometers, maybe 900. So I ran some uh, computational calculations and discovered that well, obviously, yes, there is a transition occurring um, where we see the, the peak in the one photon excitation. But just shy of that, at about 550 nanometers, there is a transition with an oscillator strength of practically zero. But it still registers as a transition. Now, if you look at the individual states for this, so the uh, that main absorption band is homo to lumo, unsymmetrical to symmetrical, makes sense. That shifted one with an oscillator strength of near zero is this homo minus one to lumo, symmetrical to symmetrical. And we see that the HOMO and HOMO minus one are practically degenerate in energy. And close examination of uh, the orbitals reveal that aside from the phase on one side of the molecule, there really isn't much different. So, uh, Calculating the two photon absorption cross section based on uh, these TDDFT results, you can see that there is a two photon absorption cross section in exactly the region I saw it experimentally, which was very reassuring. <laughs> now, another project I was involved in uh, made use of this uh, short multi-purpose uh, lanthanide ligand. And this used uh, in cyclohexane and THF, a very nice absorption at around 440, 430 nanometers. And upon complexation to all, uh, all of these eight lanthanides, we see a, a 40 nanometer shift to around 400 nanometers, but there's no change in the wavelength at 300 nanometers, which corresponds to a change in the acceptor strength, but not in uh, the strength of the diphenyl nut amino donor. So in order to complex this, you're deprotonating uh, part of this um, diketonate to allow for the positively charged metal, and that's resulting in this change in the uh, acceptor. And for the europium, we see this 
very nice uh, emission exactly where it's supposed to be at 316, sorry, 6, 12 nanometers. For the naked ligand, uh, the two photon absorption in both cyclohexane and uh, THF occurs in line with the one photon absorption. As previously mentioned, this is a um, unsymmetrical molecule, so that's perfectly expected. There is a slight shift in the slight difference in the uh, maxima, but potentially with an error. And then going towards the complex, again, we see a shift to be expected. We've seen a shift in the linear absorption, so not unsurprising to see a shift in the two photon absorption. We also see an approximate twofold increase in uh, cross sections going from about 150 to now 300, which again makes sense because we're coordinating several of these to a lanthanide center. Uh, based on elemental and mass spec data, there should be uh, three of these ligands. Um, possible that we're only exciting two at any one time. But we are able to, or we were able to achieve a two photon up converted fluorescence of this uh, European complex. We see the European peak coming in nicely at 612 nanometers. And comparing the logarithm of the integrated intensity to the excitation power, we can see that the, this is indeed two photon uh, excitation as we've got a gradient of two. So this is a, a quadratic dependency on power that proves that this is a nonlinear uh, observation. So this last project I'm going to talk about uh, involves microfabrication. So this was a, a series of new photopolymerization initiators uh, using a, a click chemistry technique and comparing the, the mono and bis uh, diphenyl and dimethyl amino derivatives. Mono and bis show reasonable agreement between uh, them, dimethyl and diphenyl uh, variants, which is in this case very low um, single figures for the dimethyl and just scraping double figures for the diphenyl. However, despite these poor cross sections, in comparison to the commercial Ergocure 369 in uh, solutions of polyethylene glycol diacrylate, PEGDA, um, we see consistent results uh, to the commercial product, at least in the case of the mono derivatives. The best derivatives didn't fare quite so well, and we can see some caving in of the structures here. But in the case of the two monos, it's consistent with the Ergocure. Um, and this is looking at uh, various concentrations, 0.8, 4, and 8 millimoles. And then varying the scanning speed. So we see that the uh, monodiphenylamino derivative 
uh, is able to operate at a uh, higher scanning speed at lower power than the uh, here. It's also able to operate at a lower concentration. See no polymerization at 0.8 millimolar, um, whereas there's reasonable polymerization at uh, 25 milliwatts for the diphenyl or you know, mono derivative. So I'd like to acknowledge my uh, PhD supervisor, Professor Kevin Belfield, um, now at NJIT, uh, after moving from uh, UCF, uh, Dr. Mike Bondar, who taught me a hell of a lot about uh, two photon absorption as well as photophysics and photochemistry in general. Uh, Ibrahim Gazvini Zadev, Jules Moorhead, Moorshead, Gresh Kataiga, and Alfonso Balestas Barrientos uh, for synthesizing uh, the molecules studied, as well as Dr. Sheng Yao and Andrew Fraser, uh, also responsible for synthesizing some of those wonderful molecules. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Moore at the University of Nottingham and Dr. Irene Henning, uh, who I worked with in the photopolymerization initiator project. And of course, my current supervisor, Dr. Dr. Louise Natrajan, as well as the rest of the Natrajan group. And again, thanks to Dr. Athir and Dr. Ula for inviting me to give this talk. Any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Adam. Thank you. So if anyone has any question, please put it in the chat box. Or if you if you would like to speak directly to Dr. Adam, just let me know. I will open the mic for you. Doctor Ula. Doctor. Yes. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, Doctor Adam, thank you so much for this great talk and for the great information you gave us. Uh, I'm really sorry to say I'm I'm not specialized in this field, but I'm wondering about. One of your slides, I think the third or the fourth one, uh, showing the uh, hemoglobin, I think, a spectrum, one of them with the oxygen, and the other spectrum without oxygen. Before this one? Before this one. Or after, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, this one. That's great. Yeah. So I'm wondering here, the, the red one uh, represents the hemoglobin without oxygen. Yes. Am I right? Yes. And the other one with the oxygen. That's correct. Yeah. So, I mean, my question is about the peak at, at, the, at, at, the, at the mid of this spectrum. Right here. I mean, can you assign to something? Uh, Am I clear? I, the red one. I, the red, uh, red spectrum. Yeah. I, I understand your question. Um, Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, it's not something I've looked at myself. Um, so I can't 
comment on on what's causing that peak. Um, it's not. I haven't looked at that paper in a while, so I can't remember whether yeah. there's well anything else in solution. Yeah. Well, I mean, why I'm asking this question because I'm very interested in, in, in the structure of hemoglobin. I mean, the iron uh, surrounding by uh, uh, nitrogen bases. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. And one of the one of the uh, position uh, represents the iron connected to the either oxygen or CO2. So this is very very interesting for me. I mean. Represent the, the 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 function, the, phys the physiological function of uh, the blood, how to transfer the oxygen, <clears throat> and uh, uh, between the lung and cells. So I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, this this question is very very interesting for me uh, about about this peak. Anyway, so I mean, th thank you very much, and thanks a lot for. Uh, your nice talk, actually. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, Adam, we have another question uh, saying how to distinguish between wavelength of ligand and wavelength of ligand with metal complex in a fluorescence spectrometer. So. Is that relating to uh, this third figure on the slide? Yeah, it's just, to, uh, is it possible to distinguish uh, through the fluorescent spectrometer between the, what is it? So this is without the metal. And do you have any other spectra with metal? Is there any difference? Or you haven't made this one? So, um, this center spectrum has the luminescence of the ligands in THF. Um, so there is a shift in the luminescence in THF. Uh, the red dotted line here, um, you can see it's centered around 6, 10, 620 nanometers, shifts to about 500 nanometers. Uh, upon complexation. So this is residual ligand. Um, these spikes and other features coming out to about 700 nanometers are the metal. Oh, okay. um, in the case of cyclohexane, this black dashed line the peak at around 480 nanometers does, it, does not shift uh, upon com complexation. So this is again residual ligand with no shift, um, but we do see again the transitions of the europium coming out to 700 nanometers. I guess the question would be why does it shift in THF? but not cyclohexane. Mm -hmm. So you're changing the, the charge on the ligand and the electron uh, density. So in a non-polar solvent, that's not going to be an impact. They're not going to be a factor. However, THF being more polar is going to see a distinct difference between uh, the neutral ligand and the complex, as well as uh, the excited state of the neutral ligand and the excited state of the complex. Um, oh. But there is residual ligand there and it can be identified. Um, we did some uh, time-gated luminescence measurements and this residual ligand falls away much quicker than the lanthanide emission, which would be expected. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. What is the difference between two photon absorption and saturable absorption? I'm not familiar with the term of uh, saturable absorption. Oh. So I'm not able to comment. That's fine. So many people thanked you for your great uh, talk. There isn't any more question. Just just wait for one minute and see if there is any other question. Of course. There is a question about the uh, fluorescent mechanism. I will check it now. So, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed, thanks for valuable information. What are the main purpose and application for that technique? For luminescence measurements or two photon measurements? Um, he didn't specify any technique. It's just he, he just said like that technique. Maybe luminescence one. Wow. Um, I don't think I could pinpoint one key technique, uh, key application for luminescence measurements. Um, it is a widely used. Yeah, that's um, right. Technique. I so. People do um, fluorescence microscopy on uh, cells, bacteria cells, cancer cells, um, using various different uh, probes that, that are specific to different regions of cells. Um, you can use uh, fluorescence tracers. Um, if you're uh, trying to identify the flow of material through pipes. Um, I mean, it, uh, you can use fluorescence measurements for sensing purposes. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm aware of uh, various metal sensors that use fluorescence readouts, um, either a change in intensity, a change of wavelength, um, and then that can that too can be coupled with fluorescence microscopy uh, to detect the presence or absence of metals or um, other analytes of interest. So it, it really is a, a widely used tool. Yeah, that's correct. I agree. Uh, we have another question. It's yeah, it's gone. Um, yeah, so um, I think it's from Mariam. She said, please, may you explain the fluorescence sensing mechanism? Um, I don't have any slides on it. So the what would happen is if we use uh, this ligand as an example, so the diketonate would be a binding site for an analyte. Um, in this case, it would be a um, an, an anion uh, because you're, you've got the electron density on the uh, oxygen, so you want a, a positively charged uh, ana analyte. Um, sorry, cation. Um, and then when that interacts, when the analyte interacts with the dye, it disrupts the electron density, similar to how the how this ligand interacts, uh, the absorption and emission changes uh, upon complexation to a lanthanide. 
So you see this hypsochromic shift um, on complexation. You would see something similar, or you could see something similar um, if you were doing sensing measurements. Um, now, the, exactly what you're sensing is going to de determine the, the size and style of uh, moiety that you use. Um, so, uh, so that then enables you to have specificity over uh, similar analytes, so you can distinguish between sodium and potassium, which will otherwise interfere with uh, sensors. Thank you so much. Is there any more question? I can't see any more. Okay, great. So, yeah, there isn't any more. Um, on behalf of the attendees, I want to thank you for your insightful presentation, and we are looking forward to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. I think there is a question from Marian. We already answered her question. Oh, oh okay. there's another question, I think. Yeah, she said, how, how may you know the difference between emission and excitation in the, in the any of compounds? So, emission, emission and excitation are different, two, two sides of the same coin. Um, if you're measuring an emission spectrum, um, you have a fixed excitation wavelength and you're sweeping across um, an emission range. So in this case, from 500 to 800 nanometers, to do an excitation, to look at excitation, you would fix the, ex the emission wavelength. So in this case, peak of 610, 620, and scan over the area of the roof. In this case, would be 200 to 500 nanometers. And what you can do is that the excitation spectrum lines up with the absorption spectrum. Intensities will be a little different, but that tells you that everything in the absor absorption is corresponding to the emission. If you start to see distinct differences, like an entire absence of uh, this peak at 300 nanometers, for instance, then it means you have an impure sample because exciting here is not generating uh, your emission out at 610. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question that I'm not sure about it saying, what is the relation between two photon absorption and self focusing? I'm afraid I can't comment on that either. Um, yeah. I think there is something missing in this question. Yeah, I think that's all. Thank you, Ida.
Thank you very much, Adam.